probably should. It's like pretty useful. Although, So stylish. 
Okay, Skylar, is it possible to lower the lights in the, in the back or over here? Hi everyone, I think most of us are here now. Um, welcome to Graphics Project 2020. Um, today we have three guest speakers um, that are gonna talk about the book, um, and the book from three slightly different perspectives, and I think you'll find it very useful as you, you know, start to think about your portfolios, uh, most immediately, but you know, you'll continue to work on books. You'll continue to think about, you know, a way of uh, sort of communicating ideas visually, um, you know, beyond GSAP. So I think you'll learn many lessons and pick up tips, um, you know, from the three lectures. So let me introduce you to our first speaker. Um, his name is Ben Furman Lee. Ben Furman Lee is a graphic designer developing work with individuals and institutions in cultural and public domains, primarily in the field of art and architecture. Together with, with Neil Donnelly, he's collaborated closely with the Met, Cooper Hewitt, Guggenheim Museum, Peggy Guggenheim Collection, Harvard GSD, and others. Um, he's designed custom alphabets for clients like Fondazione Prada and Office Alexis Mark. Um, he's also taught at, or he maybe is teaching, at Parsons um, and has been a critic, a critic at Pratt, Rutgers, uh, Yale, and here at Columbia. He holds a BFA from Art Center College of Design and an MFA from Yale. Um, and it, his talk is about the book as a collection of elements. Um, and, you know, the, a book is, a, as you all know, is a series of pages, and those pages are a collection of elements. And some of those elements are very obvious, like a text block or images. Um, but some of those elements might not be as explicit as those. So, for example, the, you know, the underlying grid, which is there, but you can't see it, um, or the folio, or the running head, um, things like the, these. So, you know, he's going to talk about the book um, seen as a collection of elements and talk about those elements and how those things come together um, in, a, in a very sort of coher cohesive way. Um, and so I think it'll be really useful. There's going to be a lot of information conveyed here, um, but I think it'll be really useful for all of you. Um, and you'll, I'm sure you'll pick up um, some new sort of lexicon as we go along. Um, ben has a lot of experience making very thoughtful and very beautiful books um, in his sort of professional career, you know, on his own and with collaborators. So um, let's welcome Ben. Thank you for that introduction and thank you all for coming um, and for having us here. Uh, as mentioned, uh, I'm going to be talking primarily about the book uh, as a collection of uh, elements. And um, the first half of this is going to be fairly didactic um, and at times even a little prescriptive. But that's to sort of set a framework uh, with which to look at uh, some other projects that I've completed. Um, both um, as an independent designer and also um, with Neil Donnelly um, 
uh, and he's also given lectures here uh, and has been a collaborator, a longtime collaborator with um, Columbia GSAP. Um, our approach, and um, this is not necessarily unique, uh, but I just want to sort of look at a framework uh, and an approach to how we look at making books and what that process uh, sort of means for us uh, as, as graphic designers. Um, firstly, we always begin with content, and um, you will begin with content, largely content that you've produced uh, during your two or three years uh, here at GSAP. Uh, and looking at that content um, in retrospect, and uh, perhaps what you want to say about it as a cohesive whole, as a body of work. And um, we do the same thing. The material might just be different. It might be for a collection of art at a, at a museum, uh, maybe a collection of essays um, that are being sort of edited and um, congealed together uh, to, to form an argument. Uh, it could be a collection of m mostly images. It could be a collection of mostly text. Either way, that content is, the, is, is always the starting point. Therein lies a lot of your answers for what you want to tease out. And from that content, uh, we develop a concept, uh, some sort of um, a graphic concept, a graphic narrative, uh, an idea that will drive the way that that content is um, ultimately printed on a page and in sequence, uh, right, as far, as far as the book is concerned. Um, and so the concept then has to be linked to a form, some sort of visual form. Uh, and uh, this is a sort of linear way of looking at this, uh, but I've found that actually there's a more cyclical relationship, if you'd like, that um, once you do arrive at a certain form that expresses a concept uh, around which organizes a, a certain uh, set of content, that maybe that form actually has something to say in, in turn uh, about the content uh, to begin with. And so it actually uh, has, has sort of seemed more beneficial or more preferable to think about it this way. Um, the frameworks or the elements that make up uh, a book as a traditional medium, uh, you know, these, these are all things that sometimes, as Yunjai said, like we take for granted. Um, but we like to use those things, uh, structures, organizations, uh, sequences, as ways not to just organize content, but actually to maybe say something unique uh, about it. Armand Mevis, who is uh, one member of a duo, uh, Mevis and Van Dersen in Amsterdam, uh, graphic design studio, sums up a lot of uh, what I'm going to talk about today as far as a collection of elements nicely uh, in a small book, uh, a small essay in a book called The Form of the Book Book. Um, and he acknowledges the sort of obvious limitations, uh, many of which all three of us are going to talk about uh, this afternoon. But acknowledging those limitations and the sort of uh, tried and true things that make up uh, your standard book are actually you know, options and um, uh, places for a lot of creativity. Um, in the end, if you are able to link the content to your concept and the concept to a form, you have, ex you have succeeded. And to find this form, you're restricted on many fronts. There were techno technical restrictions. Most books, of course, are printed on paper, uh, with few exceptions. Uh, the printing is offset lithography, or laser print, color laser print, black and white. These are always sort of um, you know, assumptions that, that you go into as far as how this thing will, will be uh, produced in the end. Um, dimensions of the book are often premeditated by the uh, limitations of the press and the size of the paper that can uh, be run through. Um, there's always sort of elements to consider as far as the gutter, uh, the edges of the spread. Um, there's a number of ways that you can bind with spirals, um, saddle stitch with staples, you can sew it with thread. Uh, all of these things, you know, contribute to what makes a book a book, but really in the end they, they all look like books. Um, and that's not a bad thing. This is a tried and tested media that uh, we've known in its sort of current form, really, for about 500 years. Uh, that books don't really look all that different um, than they did uh, in, the, in the mid and late 1400s. Um, and uh, that means, as a sort of 
tested medium that the formal elements of a book, they remain practical and they remain fundamental parts of its construction. That said, all of those elements are uh, subject to choices that you as um, designers, you as the maker of your portfolio books, we as graphic designers um, all have in our hands. So as I said, this, this sort of uh, lens through which to see a book as a collection of elements, this first half is going to be sort of didactic and prescriptive. Uh, we're going to look through four uh, significant elements um, and, and how they contribute to sort of uh, the sum of a book's whole. And that's typography, uh, the grid, images, and then uh, a, a bit more of an in-depth look at the apparatus of, as a sort of like index of, of all of the elements that sort of um, make up a book um, as far as page numbers, covers, spines, um, these kinds of things. So first is typography, which is, of course, the carrier of, of visual language uh, that's printed on a page. And um, I want to talk about just sort of three overarching uh, sort of groupings. And one is sort of distinguishing between type classifications, um, which, again, sometimes we all take for granted. We open our phones. We look at a, a news article. Uh, type is you know, sent to our uh, phones and our laptops at great speed. We don't really think about what we're looking at. Um, but these forms, serif, sans serif, uh, contemporary, old style, they all have a particular aesthetic, um, you know, underpinning, whether we are conscious of it or not. Uh, my hope is that today you'll see a little bit more of that as you um, are sort of consuming information at a very rapid rate. <laughs> Uh, then kind of an important distinction between what is considered and what we call a text font and a display font uh, and those sort of their two respective roles that they play um, in books and then also just some typesetting basics like uh, really um, basic formal techniques for for looking at a text block or uh, a bit of communication um, it's really important to keep in mind that the development of typographic form what what letter forms look like uh, has really been linked almost entirely to uh, developments in uh, technology, the way that type is produced, the way it is used, printed, um, and distributed, and now obviously um, you know, broadcast on, uh, on web or uh, mobile devices. Um, so in the history of looking at type, um, the first movable type that was mass produced and, and cut from metal was still designed to look like and emulate the human hand. It had a very humanistic quality. And in fact, most, um, most typefaces that were first cast in metal actually came with several different versions of uh, a, a lowercase letter A, for example, or various modifications to like a lowercase letter D. All that to say is that when this gets uh, set up and, and actually inked and printed that no letter form looked completely machine made, if you will, because you saw sort of some of these irregularities. Um, and of course the metal uh, castings weren't perfect either. So there was sort of this trace of the human hand that was still present in mechanical uh, mass produced printing. Fast forwarding, and, and I should say this is a very broad um, and very brief sort of like, uh, separation of, of these, these two um, classifications. But uh, in terms of what we look at in modern type, uh, things are now, of course, produced with uh, Bezier curves and are digitally uh, produced to like near precision. And um, these uh, methods of manufacturing, mass production, elimination of ornament, all came sort of with the turn of the century. Um, and uh, sort of demonstrates an evolution. Here's a great illustration of that. On the left, you see a printing of um, an old style Roman type by Francesco Griffo in 1496. Um, this was uh, printed by um, Aldus Minucius and uh, you know, a moment in time when uh, the large format of books that Gutenberg were printing uh, you know, were certainly uh, reduced a little bit and became a little bit more familiar a little bit more easy to handle as a, 
as an object. Um, but this on the left you see is, is sort of the uh, sort of the archetype uh, of something that we'll see later as a, as a typeface that's still currently in use in a digital form. Um, 500 years later, it's kind of miraculous. Uh, on the right is uh, a printing of um, Grotesque 215 uh, from 1926. And as you can tell, you know, there's a sort of, um, there's a brutal difference between the two. Uh, one is, one has serifs, which are the small um, horizontal strokes at the ends of, of the letter form terminals. And then on the right, you see sort of an elimination of any of that. Uh, it's a much more structural, sturdy, um, almost a monoline, uh, meaning it sort of feels like it's all the same um, stroke width. Um, and so this is like a really, again, broad, um, reductive kind of look at this. But it does have a very different tone of voice if you look at them um, side by side. Um, I was also asked to, you know, sort of in a really uh, prescriptive way, look at, you know, a handful of like eight to ten typefaces that have really stood up and stood the test of time. Um, and that you know, we would actually offer as sort of like almost a recommendation uh, to you who are designing uh, your portfolios and beginning to think about what a typographic voice might look like. On the left, you see just, again, a broad classification of serifs, and on the right, um, a, pretty, a fairly wide variety of, um, of, of sans serifs. Um, and these, again, have stood the test of time. There are some on the left, which were originally cast in metal, uh, even some on the right as well. Uh, these have all been now digitized uh, and are now available as, as software. Um, and it's, uh, it's, again, remarkable. Monotype Bembo uh, is the sort of, it is the extension of what we just looked at from Francesco Griffo in 1496. And Bembo is still used today um, on everything from Peter Saville's record covers uh, for Joy Division in the 80s um, to, you know, refined art catalogs. Um, Futura, on the other hand, for example, is probably the most popular long-standing geometric uh, sans serif that was developed in the early 1900s, but is like still used as um, like a corporate typeface for Nike, uh, for Supreme. I mean, this is obviously uh, still part of the cultural um, sort of uh, visual aesthetic. Um, others here are a bit more nuanced, but Accident's Grotesque, too, has been around for a uh, uh, hundred years as well, and yet is still used in um, architectural publications uh, of all kinds. So these are, this is a pretty good list, highly curated, of course, on my part, because I made these selections. Um, so you can disregard them if you want entirely, um, but hopefully uh, they might serve as a good um, sort of like just groundwork from which you can, you can take. Uh, there's also implications about like how type is handled. It's not just what the letter forms themselves look like, uh, but it's also the sort of structure on the page. Um, on the left, you see another one of uh, Aldous Minutius's print. Uh, this is another Roman that was cast by Francesco Griffo. It's set with really generous margins uh, on the left and bottom part of the page. Uh, it sort of respects the golden section, uh, it is like considered a masterpiece of Renaissance printing. Uh, on the right, 500 years later, uh, this is a uh, page from a monograph uh, for um, uh, an, art, an artist uh, who does video and installation and sculptural work. Uh, the book's called Sources in the Air. It was designed by Mavis and Van Dersen. It's set in Univer, which we just saw on the previous slide. It has very tight margins at the top and bottom using a very like economic sort of use of the page. Just fills all the way, set sort of right in the middle. You'll notice that on the left, it's what's called full justified, which is the text is, uh, is filling an entire sort of structural box. There's no, there's no irregularity. On the right-hand side, you see that uh, the type is flush left with a rag right, meaning that the um, text is unjustified, doesn't meet that perfect rectangular text block. Um, the text just flows until it hits the end of the line and then goes to the next. Um, so these are two very different, obviously, styles um, uh, and maybe represent two different very uh, 
divergent ideologies too. Um, so uh, to move on from that sort of, again, broad classification, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between a text and a display font. Um, and this is an important thing because you are obviously going to be working with all elements of your portfolio uh, you know, from, from small captions at, at a very like, uh, much smaller scale to maybe what might happen on the cover, which might be a larger and a more expressive scale. Um, so a, what we call a text face um, is really intended for use at smaller scales uh, for longer discursive texts. Um, a, often, a, you know, a longer line length, uh, maybe for the body of, of a block of content. On the other hand, display type uh, might be used for larger scales. They're much more um, they're much more uh, strong in impact and sort of a, a maybe visual weight. Uh, and again, a good example would be like a headline or a poster. Um, you see, uh, the the GSAP lecture poster series often have. Uh, a lot of expressive display typography. Um, again, to make for an immediate impact, to draw a viewer in from a distance, perhaps, to say something expressive about what's going on. It's good to think about it in terms of, um, you know, just sort of how they work and the roles that they play. Text type is much more sort of functional, you might say, whereas display type is more expressive. Uh, text type needs to be very legible and easy to sort of read and digest and, and um, move quickly through a text. Display type might be a little more disruptive. It might make you think. It might uh, connect much more in, in a formal sense to uh, something that's happening in the poster. I also like to think about it in terms of a distance. Um, text type is more like a marathon. Display type is much more like a sprint. Um, the attention span that it sort of takes, one is over a longer period of time to read and consume a text. The other, again, like I said, is like for an instant sort of um, millisecond of an impact. Or if you like, <laughs> I like to think of type in, as uh, furniture in a room sometimes, graphic design often, or arranging elements on a page as sort of arranging furniture in a room. Um, this is sort of the best way I can describe this. A folding chair uh, as text or a, 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 a Wegener shell, a shell chair. Um, one is meant for uh, you know, a, a large audience. Uh, the other is maybe to make a statement sort of in a room. <laughs> um, to look just comparatively at like, what I really mean, uh, I, I just set a few things in uh, a, a text face on the left and a display face on the right. In this case, we have Times New Roman, um, one of the most tried and true serifs uh, of, of the last 100 years. Um, and then on the right, we have something from the late 60s uh, called Syntex. Uh, again, you don't want to read Syntex. Uh, you, know, uh, you, know, you don't want to digest your news, uh, for example, <laughs> in Syntex. Um, but you might want to uh, express something much more uh, radical uh, with Syntex. On the left, we have Accidents Grotesque. Uh, on the right, we have Mistral, um, which is a, like totally bizarre sort of imitating handwriting brush script. Um, again, you would not want to read uh, a long, arduous essay about theoretical architecture set in Mistral. Uh, Baskerville is a great uh, British transitional type. Um, again, you notice sort of the weight. Uh, it, it feels quite even in texture, balanced. Um, on the right, you have Antique Olive which was designed by French type designer uh, Roger Escavon. Uh, it's got a lot more expression, um, strange weight distribution between top and bottom. Uh, it's, it's quite wide and extended, sort of, like in terms of its proportion. Um, again, it's probably going to be much more pleasant to read a longer text in Baskerville than it would be in Antique Olive Large. So now to talk a little bit about um, nuts and bolts of um, Typesetting itself. Um, this is just sort of a, a, a brief run through of uh, some comparative text blocks. And um, when you're setting type in a computer, it has certain algorithms and scripts that are running to format the text. It doesn't mean that it's always right. In fact, most of the time, it means that it's not right. <laughs> um, and there are things that you can do as a designer working with this software to change, to modify, to adjust. Uh, 
the way that text is set. So on the left, you see something that's default justified, meaning it's just exactly the way that the computer flowed in the text. On the right is something that I've manipulated and changed in terms of the spacing, um, the tracking, uh, the word spacing. Um, and you'll notice, too, that the left, maybe the text block is a bit narrow. You can see some um, irregular negative spaces. We call these rivers that sort of flow through the breaks in the text, right? It's a little unpleasant. Here, we have like sort of a much nicer, cleaner texture overall. And in type, we talk a lot about uh, the color of type, meaning the sort of like the density or the value, um, the sort of hue of the type, if you will, uh, so that, that you see sort of an even color on the right, where on the left, you sort of see some, some like static in a way. Um, there are some like strange things happening. Um, in this case, on the left, the letting is, is way too loose, right? What happens is that the text block begins to break down and it begins to look just like lines rather than a cohesive block. And what you want is sort of something that feels evenly balanced between both the line length and also the distance between lines of text. Again, I apologize for the like extreme nerdiness of this, <laughs> but these are practical um, sort of comparisons to just help you in um, how you sort of begin to think about um, your own your own typesetting. Here the letting is far too tight, and the letting is, the, is also a term that we use to describe the distance between um, lines of type. Uh, this also is leftover terminology from when type was actually set in metal, and strips of lead were used to set in between the actual lines of type. Um, so letting, even though it doesn't exist anymore when we're typesetting digitally, it's just a term that has been sort of um, passed on. Um, but you can also say line height, and it means the same thing. Um, so here on the left, yeah, the line height is, too, is far too dense. You can see characters are actually colliding with each other, um, which you don't want. It creates dark sort of spots almost in the text, um, and uh, is really hard to read, right? Here, the tracking is too tight. The tracking is the distance between uh, letter forms uh, themselves. And now the, the text feels like it's maybe OK in terms of the line height, but because the tracking is so tight, letters, again, are sort of running into each other. And what begins to happen is that, again, the line becomes a little bit too legible as just a strip, um, a, as a sort of like graphic strip, rather than, again, just sort of a nice balanced texture. Here, the tracking is far too loose, right? The words themselves actually start to break down. You sort of start to lose what, where a word ends and where another word begins. This can disrupt someone's reading pattern and slow it down, which you really don't want. Um, additionally, now moving into left justified or unjustified text, um, the computer will also do certain things in a default manner um, that are maybe not always desirable. This is, this is like extreme. Um, sort of nitpicking as far as typesetting is concerned. So you don't have to be worried about this. However, I do want to point it out that there is a difference and that you can control it. Um, so here, if you look at the way that the text ends on the uh, right side of the text block, in one case, in a graphic reduction, you see the sort of irregularity. And what you don't want are sort of undesirable shapes to start happening, um, sort of undo like uh, waves. On the right hand side you see something that's been modified a little bit and, uh, and changed to be sort of an alternating uh, sort of rag that feels a little more balanced. Again, here's the sort of default rag and the typeset rag on the right and a graphic sort of reduction of that. Okay, moving on to uh, a little bit zooming out uh, from type, uh, looking at a grid. Um, Grids are, and to begin at a really large scale, uh, in the macro sense, and then we're going to move into smaller scale. Um, grids orchestrate a great deal of our lives, whether we're conscious of it or not. Um, they are ways of organizing spaces, places, um, even uh, text on a page, uh, images on a page. And um, this is a, a reductive sort of line illustration of Manhattan. And you can see like really directly where the original, uh, where the original city um, as, a, as a Dutch uh, settlement began. And it's sort of like uh, 
uh, a bit more of a hodgepodge uh, down below um, in the southern tip. And then all of a sudden, you see an immediate uh, north-south perfect grid, um, 90 degree axis uh, that came thereafter. Um, it's true that you can actually go to Central Park and find uh, metal stakes in the ground where the original planned cross sections of avenues and streets uh, were, were going to be going. Central Park was sort of um, not part of the original city plan, but as you probably all know. Um, but these stakes are still kind of in the ground uh, throughout some of the rolling hills of Central Park. Moving a little bit smaller scale into a space, into a physical space, this is sort of like the modernist dream, right? This is from uh, Joseph Mueller Brockman's uh, book called Grid Systems. And this is a sort of illustration of a grid in a three dimensional space, organizing everything from, this is like an exhibition space, of course, but every, organizing everything from the texts to uh, images or parts of the installation to armatures themselves, even the ceiling lights. Um, it's a bit maniacal. <laughs> but um, illustrative still of how grids as an underlying system, the sort of like skeleton, uh, can actually organize uh, everything from a large scale city to a room um, to something that might be a little more illustrative. Um, this is an uh, installation, just a pop-up installation as part of the 27th uh, Brno Biennial of Graphic Design. Um, and it was a display of all of the known book covers of a particular designer uh, for a publisher. And this represents a collection um, and part of the work of, of uh, Adrian Vasquez and uh, Wayne Daly, who are um, British designers. But they had this collection, and here it is perfectly gridded. Uh, and this, the negative spaces that you see are all the uh, absent uh, book covers from this collection. So it becomes actually, in this case, a sort of uh, way of communicating some information. Um, this tightly gridded system uh, you know, demonstrates something about this collection of book covers. And then moving down into the page, uh, back in terms of our book, again on the left is a sort of, this is a, a, a page from Gutenberg's Bible in 1455. And on the right from 1980, uh, a poster for Joseph Mueller Brockman's uh, poster design that you know, is, is an askewed uh, grid, but it still is, is present. And I'm not sure if you can see the white, sort of faint white lines there. Um, but what appears to be a very like, fluid and sort of dynamic poster is actually really, really hyperstructural underneath. Um, a grid can serve, uh, this, is a, 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 this is a page or a few pages out of uh, Yale's Constructs, which is sort of like a broadsheet um, designed by Hyo Kwan. And uh, you can see here, much like any broadsheet or newsprint, a really rigid four-column grid um, that organizes both text and image uh, really well. You can see on the right-hand page the rule above the top, right above the title. Um, there's a break in the first column because that's signifying actually that that's some continuing information from a previous uh, sheet and that the new rule that begins above academic initiatives and events um, is the beginning of a new set of content. Um, some very modest rules break up parts of these, but otherwise it, it looks uh, like a pretty cohesive um, and structured four column grid. And down even to the letter form themselves, uh, type is much like music in terms of um, notes and the space between notes. Uh, this is obviously a sort of, um, this is an old uh, style uh, of type that we don't really use too much anymore, but um, or you don't see too much anymore. Uh, but this demonstrates perfectly the rhythm between the vertical strokes of these characters and the space between them. Um, and really, this is foundational to even the way that the Latin alphabet looks today. Um, Here's a, a few brief diagrams from uh, a type designer named Gerrit Neuja, uh, and, and he wrote a book um, that uh, talks about his own uh, type design methods and writing methods. And this demonstrates very clearly uh, something that looks, begins to resemble much more like what we're accustomed to in terms of the Latin alphabet, but still, still illustrating the important rhythm and cadence between strokes and spaces between the strokes. Here you see examples of bad spacing based on the like width of the strokes. Figure one is way too tight. Figure three, uh, figure two and figure one are too tight. Figure three and two and figure four are way too loose. Um, here they are sort of balanced, a nice rhythm and structure between the proportion of the letter form 
and uh, how it looks. But this is really, you know, this is a grid, essentially. Or if you like to think about it, um, a grid is really a skeleton, right, around which content is built. Um, it is invisible to most, but uh, it gives structure, it gives um, a sort of underlying logic that can help organize and, um, and also create a diversity of um, uh, sort of expressions. This whole presentation is in fact existing on a grid itself. Um, and that's to just help the organization of all the content there. Um, this is an extract from um, a book uh, called Designing Books, Theory and Practice. Um, and it, this is a nice illustration of a, of a three by six modular grid. Uh, you can see on the right, the page from which this is extracted, my illustration on the left of this exact thing. You can see faintly the red lines that sort of uh, dictate where columns of text, where different sizes of images can be placed, and the size of the gutters, or the spaces between those things, um, are sort of governing their placement on the page. So setting up a really good grid to begin any project is uh, extremely helpful. It's gonna save you a lot of headaches um, and a lot of arbitrary decisions that you might make otherwise. This helps provide, like I said, a sort of logical framework, a structure around which to um, sort of organize all your content. Moving on, just briefly, because um, there's gonna be more discussions about images and printing and whatnot, but I do wanna talk about the image because it's still an element of the book, uh, and in a really simple sense, um, I want to talk about sort of the, the, the difference between uh, various ways of, of printing or reproducing images. Um, on the left, of course, you have a full color image. This is intended to be a sort of like one-to-one -one, um, reproduction, right? Just trying to capture everything that there is about, um, about the original. Of course, it's being reproduced. Anyways, we acknowledge that. This is not the original Mona Lisa. This is just a digital image of it. But if being printed, a full color image is trying to be as true to the, the, the original as possible. When it's in grayscale, it sort of seems like there's one step of translation, it's one step removed, it becomes maybe a bit more archival. Um, it removes some of the information that might be important and just maybe reduces it a little bit to, to form um, or value. Uh, again, it's just one step of translation uh, that maybe changes its feeling. It maybe feels less true. It's allowed, you're allowed to sort of look at it with a bit of a, a, a more distance rather than something that's trying to be a true reproduction. You can take that one step further and actually produce that grayscale image in, a, in just one uh, ink color, we'll call a monochrome, um, or two, you could you have a duotone image. But this becomes something really different. This is like a third degree of trans, or maybe a second or third degree of translation. It feels a little bit more like a, like a Warhol print in some ways where it becomes um, something that's really not interested in reproducing the thing as, um, as true to its, it, to its original, but might actually be saying something about it, uh, might be commenting on, on the nature of this reproduction. Um, a halftone is another way of producing images, particularly you'd see in like a web, uh, web offset printing like newspapers are really uh, coarse images. This might actually sort of intentionally uh, reduce the, the value of the image. It feels a little bit, um, a little bit watered down, a little bit reductive, um, and maybe in some cases it feels a little more familiarized or a little more pop, depending on your um, sort of frame of reference. But uh, it is important to be considerate of what you might be trying to say with your images. If you're producing um, a really beautiful photograph of a model that you've made, you probably want that to be in full color because it's going to be a truest representation of um, uh, the model itself that you want to reproduce in the book. Um, something like sketches, for example, that maybe come from very different sources. You might have been using different pens at the time um, to make those drawings. They might be uh, drawn in different types of paper. And so you might want to try and reduce all of those differences to just look at the like formal qualities of the sketch, for example. And reproducing those as grayscale might be a way to sort of unify um, a, a collection of sketches in that sense. And it's not so important to be true to the original um, itself, right? So those are kind of ways that you can think about images and how you produce. Again, there's going to be a lot more said about this in detail um, following me. Finally, to look at a sort of lexicon uh, of the things that make up uh, the sort of like uh, frameworks of books and the things that we sort of often take for granted, like every book has page numbers. Um, they're always numerical most of the time. Uh, they're providing a sort of um, sequence. You always have a cover. 
Uh, you always have a spine. You always have a back cover. You always have a table of contents. These are elements that just sort of like we take for granted and assume are going to be there in part of a book. But what you do with them, how you choose to use them, might actually say something, uh, might actually have a profound effect about how a reader enters the, the space of your book or your narrative. Um, so to look at covers to begin with, I've created sort of just um, an overview or sort of catalog, again, highly curated, but um, uh, of covers and uh, page numbers and spines, things to just look at and, and dissect sort of as a, as a group, um, almost a collection of a collection of elements, if you will. Um, and I'm going to start with covers and sort of breaking this down just into like their approach. So this is type only, so doing just typography on the cover to um, uh, to sort of draw a reader in, to make a statement. Maybe it's an extraction of what's happening on the inside. Um, but this is using only typography as the primary visual element. Um, I often prefer uh, strictly typographic covers, and it's largely because what you do with it and how you manipulate the type um, often leave the most room for interpretation. It remains the most ambiguous in a way to um, to a viewer. If you begin with an image, it's hard to enter the space of uh, that book without any other idea except for the very specific image that you've seen. Um, also, how do you uh, sum up the entire contents of a book, collection of images, uh, in some cases with just one image? What is, how does that one representative image capture the whole thing? It's very hard. Uh, with typography, you have a bit more freedom and you can leave a bit more room for interpretation or imagination on the part of the reader. Um, here are two covers that also consider both the front and the back as, uh, and we'll talk more about the one on the right in a little bit, but the one on the left um, is from an artist monograph called Speaker Receiver. Um, and uh, Speaker is, is printed on the front receiver on the back. The whole title is not visible, um, but it becomes more of a dialogue. It acknowledges the volume of the book itself um, as both having a back and front cover. It invites the reader to maybe turn and look at it um, from, from both sides. Um, similar with architectures all over, um, the blurb and the contributing authors on the back is printed in reverse on the front cover. Uh, even, the, even the barcode is printed in reverse on the front cover in white. Um, the title is uh, printed in black and reading correctly on the front cover and then printed in reverse and in white on the back cover. Um, again, that's to acknowledge the sort of uh, both sides of a front and back cover. Um, on the flip side, image only sort of creates a very atmospheric, um, uh, much more uh, sort of in some ways mysterious way. There's no title. Um, it's a bit of a bold gesture. Um, and it creates something of mystery and intrigue uh, as to what might be inside. It's um, it also going to invite some imagination on the part of the reader. Um, Rituals and Walls on the left actually comes uh, packaged with um, sort of a, a, a clear wrap, and there's a silkscreen uh, print on that that when you, you know, unpackage the book, it gets thrown away. But in reality, the cover is, is just this... Um, just this wall itself. Um, for a monograph of Giuseppe Pannona, um, the inner life of forms, this sort of beautiful um, full wrap image of the box set of, of these sculptures wraps the whole thing. One of these trees goes up the spine. It's quite nice. Um, here on the far right is a, a program for um, a playhouse in Zurich. And it, this is a composite image of like all of the actors from that season um, layered on top of one another. It's a pretty evocative image. Uh, simultaneously, type and image working together, um, and how how those two might might play off one another, be layered over one another, say something about one another. There is a relationship um, where the title uh, or the text meets the image, uh, and might, in fact, between those two things, generate a third meaning. In some cases. There are other cases, too, where a cover is not treated exactly or traditionally as a cover. John Berger, Ways of Seeing, was uh, a phenomenal um, example of that, designed by Richard Hollis. Um, the text begins immediately on the front cover. Even one of the first uh, figures that's illustrating this text begins on the front cover. There's a sense of immediacy, right? Same with the Yale MFA photography book, designed by Neil Donnelly. Um, the essay, the, the sort of supportive essay for this 
um, small exhibition catalog begins right away. So there's an immediacy, there's a sort of like um, no frills, just sort of immersion into what's gonna happen. There's no formality of a cover and a title page, a table of contents. It just begins right away. And um, there's something quite nice about that. Uh, I am a camera, the Satya Gallery 2000. This is a, a different case altogether where the cover actually sort of exists halfway between the book and it's a large, um, it's a sort of a tome. Uh, so it's an impressive object too. Uh, but this is just a plate and a caption that begins on the front cover. Um, so it's, it's a sort of disarming thing in repositioning or reimagining where that cover exists. Um, you could think about uh, layers, layering information. Um, Data Globe Reconstructed has the title of the book typeset and designed by the designers um, printed beneath a reproduction of a letter uh, written by Tristan Zara, uh, kind of giving a, a, a sort of mandate about what this exhibition might be, and it went unrealized for, you know, 100 years. Um, but that letter is printed in full uh, beneath. Uh, for platform, that's a sort of like uh, composite of several different kinds of covers that are happening on the inside, um, and everything all at once, the, uh, a, small, a small collection of um, Moss's work designed by Neil Donnelly, uh, actually reproduces the entire contents of the book on the cover, all sort of compressed in one moment. Um, so layers are an interesting opportunity to think about things um, and how you might bring what's inside of the book to the outside. Um, exposed content might do something similar. Uh, for example, on the far right, the 100th issue of OAS magazine um, or journal, uh, which is um, when it celebrated its 100th uh, issue, it did a, a special on um, the current designer, Carl Martins, who's been uh, responsible for its design and output for the last couple of decades, creates a full index of the entire history in reverse chronological order, beginning with 100 and going back to its um, origins, of like all of the print details about um, each of those issues and who was designing it, and um, uh, a pretty nice gesture. It continues on into the inside as well. Um, okay, table of contents. These are also sort of um, elements that, again, we all take for granted because we just assume they ought to be there and they ought to be in the beginning. Um, they provide a wayfinding, they provide a fundamental sort of functional use. And, um, you know, that is important, but it also might be an opportunity to play. Uh, the way that you direct a reader into the text might be in an unconventional way. You can look at scale changes. Um, Sometimes oversized type, uh, a little more irreverence might allow for some, um, some more legible gestures. Um, on, in the example on the far right, there are actually multiple paginations for each of the artists who are being featured in, in this catalog, and they happen in, in two places, so both on page three and on page 127, um, which is a bit strange. We usually are accustomed to seeing uh, just one page number for a piece of content that we're looking for. Um, a table of contents can be seen as a number of other things. Instead of um, titles of essays or sections, uh, an example on the left, it's um, just marked by quotations that are framing each of those sections. Um, this example in the middle comes from a book called Tools and Architecture. Uh, it actually reproduces, the, the table of contents is a spread that reproduces the entirety of the book as a book map um, in small thumbnail icons with the page numbers beneath them. Um, so the table of contents becomes an entirely visual thing. Um, on the far right, a book that was just produced by, um, or published by uh, Columbia Books on Architecture in the City called Ways of Knowing City. Um, the, this is uh, an example of uh, a, um, a table of contents that is sort of used as a map and uh, these, these pieces are reproduced in, in a full scale on the title pages of uh, those essays. This one on the left should look very familiar to you. It's the table of contents from Abstract. Um, and in a way, uh, Abstract, of course, has sort of uh, several covers all at once, depending on where you want to enter. Uh, in this case, they were kind enough and generous enough to provide a sort of marker about where you are. So it really is providing a sense of wayfinding um, with just that black box. The same exact table of contents is reproduced on um, all five sections or four sections uh, as you as you move through. The uh, 
the pagination might change completely, and in this case, the table of contents is actually just the, uh, the page numbers are replaced with the um, initials of the, of the artist that's being featured. Or if you like and you, and you sort of enjoy the structure of a classical um, table of contents, um, then that option obviously seems, in a, in a really contemporary context, seems actually kind of um, alarming and maybe different because it is um, sort of returning something more tried and true. Spines themselves uh, are also an opportunity um, for uh, ways in which ideas inside of your book might find their way on the exterior. Um, in one case, uh, on the far left, a series of thumbnail images uh, are replacing what would traditionally be text. Uh, the text might go, uh, be run from, from top to bottom rather than rotated on its side, as in Perspective 45. Um, what does it mean when you have a spiral binding and there really, there sort of is no spine, there's no graphic surface with which to play. Um, in uh, the example before history, uh, these are two books that are part of, uh, and they're two different sizes as well, um, that are part of the same uh, sort of publication, uh, and the type is split across the spine of both of those, but therefore sort of co coheres it as a whole on the shelf. Um, what does it mean when your spine has nothing on it uh, and it's completely blank? Um, when you have a, a, a really wide spine and it becomes um, an, an opportunity for some graphic play. In this case, this is actually just a, a book of paper samples, but um, the punctuation uh, and the period between GF, the initials GF, um, has been brought up from the letter I in Smith and sort of occupies that same um, space. Um, spines can be also uh, sort of imbued with narrative value. This is a um, eight volume or seven volume series of uh, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Sort of a beautiful illustration um, that uh, says something, it uses that space uh, and acknowledges where this will sit as a like set, right, um, on, a, on a shelf. Um, and again, is imbued with narrative value that um, wouldn't really be uh, achievable in any other case than on its spine and here on a shelf. Um, folios or page numbers. Uh, again, this seems really sort of like reductive and sort of um, as something that we take for granted, but there are opportunities and there, there are things that um, how you treat these might, might uh, affect how a reader actually sort of perceives the page. Um, if, if a page number is oversized, it really puts a lot of attention on where a reader is. Perhaps your book is extremely thick and you want to make sure that a reader knows exactly where they are all the time. An oversized page number will help do that. Page number might be more modest, set in the corner. Um, page numbers might be rotated on a 90 degree axis, made very small. In this way, they sort of get out of the way, right? They sort of uh, remove themselves from being too uh, intrusive on the content. Uh, what happens if, if you need to use a graphic element to maybe demarcate this type of page from another type of page? Um, if uh, the type is rotated in bold, and in this case it's paired with an ongoing series of um, titles, um, if a page number is also more modest and just sort of does the role that it needs to play, um, could be printed in color, could be uh, included with a timestamp uh, so that a page number becomes something uh, a little bit more um, than just a place in a book, but also as a place in time. Uh, in this case, on the far right, um, these are, again, the artist initials are marking the space uh, that you are. There are no page numbers in this case. Uh, the, the initials are just used, um, and, uh, and it sort of is the only sense of wayfinding that you get. And really then puts, puts the focal point on the featured artist or on the featured subject rather than where you are in a particular narrative. Similarly, if, um, it, if you use al uh, the alphabet instead of a numerical uh, ordering system, uh, that changes how someone might perceive um, how you're displaying and uh, framing the contents. If you might want to sandwich the pages, page numbers in the gutter, uh, that really removes them, makes it very hard actually to, to figure out where you are. Um, in a way, it's, it's you know, maybe a bit too uh, sort of um, 
I don't know, ungenerous to a reader uh, to do that when they just want to find their way to something. <laughs> um, but you might have very good reason for doing that, um, and, and it often has a bit more of a sense of playfulness. Um, bold and oversized, again, will do something uh, totally different to, to really call your attention. Um, they also sort of provide a really, you know, in this case, they're at the lower margin of a page. They provide a really, like, stark um, sort of, like, frame or sort of corner of a frame uh, for the page. All taken together, you know, they're, they're just sort of, again, there. We take them for granted. But um, it's something worth considering with how you uh, want to actually order and provide wayfinding for, for your reader. So looking at this sort of lexicon uh, and all of the elements that just sort of laid out, I want to go through just three examples of some of uh, my own work and how these things sort of play out. Um, and uh, cohere um, a, a particular book um, as a collection of elements. So first I'm going to begin with Space Pact, which is uh, the extension of um, Rafi Siegel, who's a practicing architect and, um, and professor up at MIT, uh, was working for some time at Princeton on, a, on his dissertation about the work, uh, the life of Alfred Neumann, who was sort of an unsung uh, modernist um, from the mid-century. And this is an extension of his PhD work. It began with an exhibition that uh, traveled throughout Europe, and I was working with him uh, on the design of uh, some of the exhibition elements. And I just want to show this because these are uh, full-scale reproductions of uh, uh, models, but full-scale reproductions of units that uh, this architect um, sort of created from his own proportional system and uh, using a lot of pretty bold color in occasions. Um, and these were part of the exhibition to sort of really give a sense of uh, his life's theory, work, practice, and output. Um, I'll come back to that. But uh, to begin with typography, uh, you might have a lot of decisions to make as far as why you want to choose type. And it may be for period reasons. It may be for um, sort of geographic reasons. Uh, there also be maybe narrative reasons. In my case, uh, I chose something that was had a specific narrative reason. Um, and uh, Mercator is a typeface that is, uh, to this day, unpublished, undigitized, um, but was produced um, by a Dutch designer um, in, in, well, published in 1958, although work on it began on it uh, sooner. And it was sort of modeled on earlier grotesques of the early 1900s, um, but it sort of fell out of existence for whatever economic, uh, commercial, or, um, or sort of te technological reasons. It really never was sort of popularized. It was sort of considered a Dutch response to Helvetica, which of course had massive commercial success at this time. Um, but there was something nice about it and a little bit crude about its details and the way it was made um, that still, uh, that, that quite resonated with me. And in addition to that, it was similar to, and it sort of had a parallel with Neumann's uh, architectural work, which went sort of unpublished, um, undiscussed, and fell out of, fell out of sort of like consciousness for a while until now. And so um, I was working to um, digit to draw this and, and trace this and bring this back into uh, sort of existence. So I created a digital version of this based on um, some um, metal specimens that had been printed. And there was also a nice pairing that like at the height of Neumann's work in the late 50s, early 60s was when this typeface was published. So there was both a sort of period and a, a narrative value that I found in it. Um, so the whole book is, is set in this type. Um, and uh, it, it, Rafi found a, a nice uh, sort of texture to it and, and liked seeing how all the text was set in it. And I you know, had my reasons, so um, it found its way in. There are two discrete halves of this book. One is the sort of four chapters of critical text on the, um, the life, the theory, the development, the architecture, and the cultural um, and historical sort of conditions around which a lot of um, Neumann's work was built. And um, the, the grid is itself uh, the same throughout, but uh, allows a lot of flexibility with different kinds of content. It was based on a sort of scalar um, modular grid that, that um, was true to Neumann's theories of proportion. And, uh, and it allowed for some changes between, like I said, uh, some of the um, theoretical text up front and the project text that came later on. Um, the second half is a sort of full, comp full uh, 
catalog of all 26 known built and unbuilt projects of Alfred Neumann. Um, and uh, the problem that I sort of encountered with this was the nature of the material w coming to us was uh, in large part scattered. It was everything from um, scans of old projection slides to photocopies to original photos to um, like a family collection from Neumann's surviving uh, granddaughter. Uh, it was a real hodgepodge of um, material and to sort of cohere all of this stuff into some you know, ordered, logical, narrative sense uh, really needed some work. And I, I was fortunate to come across uh, this short film that the Eames made um, called uh, House uh, After Five Years of Living, which is just this sort of photo montage of their space after having been in there for five years. And there was something about the way that they filmed it. Um, and it, it's a little bit of like details and some things staged and some things quite casual and moving from the interior to the, or the exterior to the interior um, that made me think about, and these are stills from that video, um, that made me think about a way to cohere all of this kind of information uh, for 26 uh, projects. And so uh, the work that I set out to do was to, first of all, illustrate a process, um, beginning with the site, looking at sketches, looking at models that were produced of the individual units that then created a sort of pattern that then created the structure of the building, looking at the model. And then if it was a built project, in fact, moving from there, this sort of process into construction, um, I thought about moving from, like organizing all of these uh, projects in their images from distance to proximity. So you start with images that are the furthest away and then you move uh, subsequently closer uh, to the, to the exterior of the space and even into the interior of the space where, where possible. So this is um, a town hall uh, in Aksiv in Israel. Um, and you move again from distance to the interior uh, spaces. And the book itself, while it has a really kind of a st structured grid, feels a bit, it's flexible. It's, it's a little loose because I wanted it to feel a bit like a scrapbook in a sense that you're moving through this archival material. Um, and occasionally have a full bleed spread when it's sort of an immersive image. This is um, Neumann in the lower left in, in the foyer of, of that town hall. Um, and you know, this, uh, barring few exceptions, most of this material was black and white. It was all archival material. Uh, and uh, not always great reproductions. Some of the drawings were redone uh, by Rafi in his studio. Um, but to see these um, really beautiful structures sort of play out uh, in a sequence was kind of important. Um, the last part was an appendix, which you know was sort of like supplemental material about uh, chronology of life and even sketches uh, from the time that uh, Neumann spent in a, a concentration camp. Uh, to portraits of uh, his wife, to um, hear images of, of Neumann teaching in the classroom, uh, or you know, meeting Corbusier, and uh, there's just sort of this like almost a sort of think of an appendix, a bit of like an attic in a house. It's sort of like the back room um, where some of this other information is is collected. The other thing, given that all of this stuff was black and white, and thinking about those models at the beginning uh, in the exhibition, that in fact, which used a lot of color on these geometric surfaces. The one place that I found as an opportunity to sort of inflect more of that color was in parts of the things that make up a book, which are the end papers and the headbands. So here you see just a hint of the front end paper in blue, the headband which is red, and the last uh, end paper in yellow to just have a, like, a splash of color in an otherwise pretty um, heavy academic monochrome book. Um, next, Heavenly Bodies, which is a completely different kind of uh, set of content. Um, this was a catalog that um, I worked on with Neil Donnelly uh, for the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Arts um, Costume Institute and their uh, annual spring exhibition. And this was uh, Heavenly Bodies, Fashion and the Catholic Imagination. Um, it was a sprawling exhibit uh, that was very site specific, that involved three different locations across the Met's Fifth Avenue and uh, Cloisters. Um, buildings and um, you know was uh, inc included a, a, a range of fashion from the mid-century up until uh, contemporary designers um, and all of their response to Catholic iconography um, and uh, Catholic narrative uh, and sort of how those influences played into their fashion. So uh, 
the first thing was looking at the, the, the book structure as a whole and how it would respond to the site-specific exhibition itself. Um, as I said, there were three locations and three parts of this collection. One were 60 pieces that were on loan from um, the Sistine Chapel sacristy at the Vatican um, that the curator, Andrew Bolton, managed to procure for this. Um, it included like, uh, you know, uh, vestments and uh, sort of precious headwear and a number of other things. Uh, then the second uh, portion of this was called uh, Fashioning Worship, and it really had to do with uh, a collection of a fashion that was much more sort of about pageantry, um, pomp and circumstance, if you will, uh, the cult of Mary. And uh, this was in the Met's Fifth Avenue location in the Great Hall and um, sort of adjacent medieval galleries, uh, Byzantine galleries. And then Fashioning Devotion, the third, was all the way uh, up in the, the Met's uh, cloisters uh, in, in north of Manhattan. And uh, this was much more focused on um, the uh, like sort of devotional, monastic traditions, um, and religious orders. So at the outset, it was going to be three volumes, three sort of slim case volumes that were all distinguishing these each three pieces of the show. But in fact, what ended up happening is realizing that the two, the, the last two uh, pieces of the show were actually much more uh, a whole. Uh, and that the Vatican collection was sort of the thing that was um, offset from it. Um, that also proved beneficial because the Vatican required that all of the pieces in the show and in the catalog were bound in a separate codex, completely un, you know, sort of unrelated to and trying to avoid any like um, undesirable uh, connections between <laughs> certain pieces of fashion that might have been a little more uh, forward thinking or wild. <laughs> um, so there was partly a restriction just based on what we were dealing with and also there was a sort of curatorial decision that made sense here. Um, so even though the second and third sections of this catalog and the show um, were each their own part, it felt like it made sense that they were bound together. Um, so this was the sort of like the first step. Um, we also started by looking at a lot of uh, traditions in Renaissance printing, manuscripts, and looking at some of the details. Uh, they're pretty radical, in fact, the way that they laid out, handled texts, the way that on the left hand you see like the primary text in the center with supplementary texts, commentary, uh, and whatnot sort of surrounding it, framing it, um, or these strange sort of missing chunks uh, in the two column text on the right, uh, which are actually largely um, a sort of leftover uh, or maybe an unrealized moment where a, an illuminated capital letter should have been. Um, and you'll often see that in, in certain manuscripts where an individual uh, initial is left, but um, it, it hasn't been actually illuminated. Nobody sat to illustrate that character. Um, we were also really inspired by some of the source material that was inspiring the Met's um, uh, sort of curation of fashion. And uh, one of those things were altarpieces, diptychs, triptychs, um, and these sort of perspectival uh, nested sort of structures. There's sort of an inherent structure to these uh, that seemed appealing to us. And so um, the other element uh, was typography, uh, of course, which um, there seemed like a lot of opportunity for some both necessary text weight and also some more expressive uh, um, display type. And we wanted to sort of cohere this, uh, these three sections of the book and these three uh, locations of the um, uh, museum itself and sort of find a way to express something of like a Trinitarian idea of like one and three, three and one. Um, and so uh, I drew and developed uh, some sketches for this initially and, and it ended up being something that everybody was really enthusiastic about. Um, so we finished uh, these and um, it's basically the same exact skeletal structure but expressed in just sort of a regular, what's called an inline where there's a stroke that's um, sort of dissecting uh, the vertical strokes and then open capitals. And this was all sort of you know prompted by their uh, desire to, to, to treat the, the vestments and uh, the pieces of fashion with a sort of sense of purity as they are um, and really just think about light and um, the way these things were going to be displayed would be pretty reductive in the exhibition itself. Um, 
So this was sort of a way of, of signaling kind of an opening in a way, uh, a sort of change in color and tone, but also like a way that like you could imagine light coming through um, uh, sort of in the backlight almost uh, of these capital letters. And the other thing that was kind of enjoyable about this, this is a, this is a revival of a, of a font called Daphnis from the mid-century. Um, but in looking at this, it really reminded me of Futura. And it, in fact, it's got the exact same bones of Futura, except for that it has these sort of glyphic details that are reminiscent very much of like um, text on Roman capitals, or even actually here at Columbia, you can see um, the etching in, in some of the facades. Um, but Futura is on the left, and Daphnis Open is on the right. The exact same script, no, it's like skeleton, right? So we developed this, uh, each, each piece of the show would have its own treatment, but it sort of feels familiar, but changes, transforms uh, as you move through both the spaces of the exhibition and also the space of the catalog. Um, we also decided that there were um, these heavier sheets that were tipped in or sort of stuck in between the signatures of the book. And um, the same exact uh, die was used to make this impression on these three pages. Uh, separating the three distinct sections. There was a tactile difference that when you flip through the book, you would hit this thicker page and you would know that you were entering something different. Um, but the, the text was uh, blind debossed uh, on all of these three sections, but then only printed with metallic ink in the section that you were about to enter. So it sort of was like highlighting your place uh, as you move through the text. Um, there's a detail. You can see the blind debossed just above it, but this is open and entering the third section. Um, similarly, we wanted to find a way to sort of structure the different kinds of contents, and um, again, looking back at the manuscripts uh, as inspiration and some of those the, the sort of perspectival diptychs, we decided on this sort of ascending column structure for the different kinds of uh, content that you would encounter throughout, uh, throughout the book. This is a frontispiece that also, again, is uh, imbued with like some of these nested columns itself. Um, the illustrations uh, or the figures that were accompanying the text would be placed on the interior toward the gutter. Um, we decided to just sort of use that trope of the carved out uh, text block where an illuminated uh, letter might have been, but just use this for the, the small titles uh, and authors of these contributing essays. And the rest of the book was fairly patterned in the sense that we would always have a piece of fashion in full bleed on the right-hand page and, um, or the left-hand page, and then on its opposite, <coughs> you would have the reference material, um, the, either the art, artifact or uh, the altarpiece or the painting that directly inspired that particular designer. Um, additionally, um, It was really important to the curator that we bring a sense of the place and the sort of subdivisions as he was curating and gathering and grouping these garments, how they would be expressed and connected um, in the space of the book. And so each of the subsections are uh, divided and called out by a brief text about that space in the Met's um, galleries. And so what you see on the right is uh, a, a description about the medieval galleries in the, um, in the Great Hall and about the vestments that were, that were gathered there. Um, these were all printed in a metallic spot, uh, just a single, uh, single ink uh, along with the text. And so that you could see a, quite a difference between full color uh, reproductions of both art and uh, the fashion plates and, and then the subsections that sort of divided uh, and, and sort of organized those. The cover was one place where we could sort of use and express all three at once. We wanted to pull out that sort of detail uh, of the three places as distinct, but, but, but really as one show. Um, so we took the title lock up and imposed the book's uh, nested grid structure on it. And uh, you see all three elements of uh, the typeface, but with a carve sort of in between uh, the three sections. Um, we also knew that we wanted to figure out a way to cohere this as a whole across the spine because it was the one place we knew that there was going to have to be a, um, a case for this and that we, we wanted some way. So these are il early illustrations about how, how this might uh, be achievable, but this is another case where we split the printing of um, the spine uh, across the title um, 
but that it would still be uh, usable as, as an individual volume if you, if you had it as a whole. Okay, and lastly, uh, again, totally different uh, sort of context, uh, is a book of uh, collected essays editor, edited by uh, Esther Choi and Marika Trotter. This was published a few years ago uh, by Columbia, uh, Books on Architecture in the City, so you may have seen it around. Um, but this is, uh, again, a collection of essays that are all addressing the sort of uh, double entendre that the title suggests, um, that, that architecture is both um, all over the place, um, ubiquitous, um, but also in a sort of constant uh, existential state of like, um, it, you know, its eminent demise. And uh, there was a sort of notion when talking with uh, the editors and reading through the, the, the texts that um, there was no, nobody was taking necessarily a, a direct position uh, in one way or the other, but that they were acknowledging both sort of simultaneously. And so um, one of the things that the editors said, uh, she described it as a Janus-faced gambit or a Janus-themed gambit. Um, this is a Janus coin, uh, sort of you know, dual-faced uh, god, sort of end and beginning, backwards and forwards. Um, and this provided a pretty substantial uh, motif and idea that sort of drove the rest of the design throughout the process. Um, that things would actually, uh, again, after reading and understanding the whole editorial desire, that things were actually never quite backwards nor forwards, that it was both trying to cast something into the future while also looking in the, in the past and understanding um, historical context. So in some of the display type, we flip the counters uh, so that text is sort of um, neither backwards nor forwards. Um, we also wanted to figure out a way to push an idea through both uh, type and image. And this is something that um, James Graham, uh, who you know, through his incisive uh, sort of leadership here as, um, as editor, uh, at the beginning we knew this was gonna be a, a dual, uh, or a two, two color print. It was sort of a limitation that was placed on us up front. But without that, limitation at the beginning, I don't think we would have arrived where we did. Again, this was um, one of the first things that I worked on uh, when designing with Neil. And um, we thought about a way to print both in, uh, just in black and in a, in a fluorescent spot color. Uh, and that we might see both an image in the right reading way that it's meant to be, and also perhaps in its sort of reverse um, and in a spot color that sort of therefore um, feels a little bit more secondary. Uh, it started with, largely with the title pages of the essays, uh, that you would see it in reverse always first and in the Pantone spot color, this fluorescent spot, uh, and then turn the page and see it uh, in, its, in its sort of right reading form. This idea extended into the images um, and you know, thankfully, both the editors and Columbia GSAP were extremely supportive of our, some, some of our more radical ideas. Um, and, uh, and this is a case um, where that sort of uh, collaboration um, you know, really made, made this book what it was. Uh, so here you see a figure, before you actually see it in appearing in the text, you see it in reverse as a, as a spot color. And it sort of is a layer that sort of recedes behind the primary text. Um, similarly here, a line drawing that then appears behind another figure, uh, a piece of what is to come and of course, you can imagine this grid structure is really important to keep things organized and cohered. Um, the, uh, the other benefit of this two-color print was that uh, for a number of the design contributions that had um, highlighted elements, we could use that spot color as a way to highlight uh, elements that they were uh, either in urban planning, illustrations, uh, drawings, whatever it might be, it became a really good secondary highlight color. Um, that same grid that uh, is present underneath actually is generative of, of four different layout types for the introduction, design contributions, um, essays, and then uh, interviews. And uh, again, a grid structure, while might while it might appear to be limiting, actually uh, generates a fluidity and um, a, a sort of way to dance around it, if you will, uh, and create these sort of different content types that felt like legible changes to the reader. And again, we found a way to sort of extrapolate this idea 
from the interior, beginning always with the interior, we always like to design the cover last as a sort of expression or a, an extraction of ideas that are happening on the inside. Um, so the front cover, uh, we were able to sort of impose on the back. Um, additionally, the front, uh, the title is embossed, so the text is coming up from the page, and on the back, this white text of the title is debossed and is pressing in, so it's almost like the title is punching through uh, the contents of the book. Um, and uh, um, really, you know, was kind of a, a nice a final expression of, of all the ideas that had been developed over the course of the design of the book. And just to remind you again of uh, Arma Mevis's uh, sort of position in the end, if you were able to link the content to your concept and the concept to a form, then you have succeeded. Um, so thank you very much, and I appreciate it.